Good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. We're thankful and grateful that you're here with us as we resume our Bible study, uh, as we study God's word to show ourselves approved. And I'm just glad to be alive. I'm glad to see you here on Facebook, YouTube, and I hope and pray that this Bible study blesses you. Listen, we're going to start a new Bible study to kind of transition us into next year. This year, the theme has been, we are better together. And we've been intentional about doing things together and we'll resume uh, uh, family, by, well, we'll pick up, not resume, but we'll start a new Bible study this year, family devotionals. And you'll receive those that, that we encourage you to study God's word as a family. And every third Wednesday, we will meet both in person and online to deal with this family Bible study. Uh, and so that's one of our ways we've been better together. We've been encouraging our ministries to work together and to partner with our brothers and sisters in the community. I just fully believe God has called us to community and no person is an island and is called to be in isolation. While there is such a thing as the gift of singleness, even in that, people often work together in community. That's why Psalm 133 says, behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. And I believe that's not just applicable to the brothers, but also the brothers and sisters. So this year we've been intentional about doing things together. Nobody has to feel alone or do things alone. Know that God is on your side and also God places people in your life and in your heart to serve with you and to help you along the way. And now in 2023, word Lord God has given to me to share for us to be the theme for next year is greater. Yes, God is greater than your highs and lows and anything you face, and God is calling us to greater. So the theme of 2023 will be greater. Um, God wants more out of you, and God will continue to show you that God is greater than any obstacle you face. And so know that you can trust and depend on God, and God will see you through. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being greater and bigger than anything we face and God, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, and your compassion. And God, as you help us to grow and to do greater works, God, we yield to the spirit. God, have your way. We thank you, God, for this Bible study. We thank you for this time of reflection. We thank you for the word of God. And now, Lord, as we study, as we read, as we pray and meditate and spend time in devotion, God, I hope and pray that we are better for it. We thank you, God, for this time we thank you for New Hope Baptist Church, where there is no hope like New Hope. God, we love you today. God, we pray for the sick and shut in. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those that need a rhema word from you. And so, Lord, we pray that you have your way. Move however you want to move and bless however you want to bless. It's in Jesus' mighty and matchless name, as well, as well as with the Father and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So I'm going to be... Uh, utilizing some literature, a book entitled Greater by Stephen Furtick. Um, and so um, you can buy it to follow along. That's up to you. Um, but just wanted to mention to you, page three, we're going to jump right in and, and reference the book as he references scripture. John chapter 14, verse 12 says, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus talking, of course. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. They will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. I'll say that again. Anyone who has faith in God, anyone who has faith in Jesus Christ will do what the Lord has been doing. They will do even greater things or some translations say greater works than these. The author says, I've read this verse so many times. I now have a new context for it, and it sliced me with the edge of fresh challenge. He says, greater things in Jesus, the greatest that has ever lived, the greatest being ever to walk the earth. What does that even mean? Before we even get to the greater works, what does even having faith in God mean? Faith, we believe, is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is believing in God and being faithful is being trustworthy of God. And so <clears throat> you must have faith. Faith is the foundation of so many things. It is the substance, foundation of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so are we believing God? Are we trusting God? 
do we, when we hear the voice of God, receive it? That's faith. And in difficult times, do you give in? Do you throw in the towel? Do you listen to the world or trust the world? Or do you have the kind of faith that believes God will see you through? And even in prosperous times, do you have the kind of faith that still gives God the glory? Do you have the kind of faith that still is not caught up in the materialistic things of the world, but you have the kind of faith that says, I give all glory and honor and praise to God. If you have that kind of faith, I want you to type it in the comments right now because we must have faith. And the faith leads to greater works. So the author asks, does it mean that greater works, does it mean that we'll be able to do more powerful miracles than Jesus? Have a bigger impact than Jesus? The author says, I don't think so. And I agree. But let's see what he's getting at. After all, we don't know how many people have walked on water, multiplied fish, and barley loaves to feed thousands of people, opened the eyes of the blind, given salvation to the world, healed the sick, or raised the dead. If you're looking to be greater than Jesus, as far as miracles, signs, and wonders, that's not happening. But by leaving and then sending his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell inside his followers, those who are faithful to God, ordinary people like you and me, Jesus released a greater power for us to do extraordinary things on an extraordinary scale. The kinds of things the early church saw and did, the kinds of things he still wants to do today through us. In other words, Jesus coming down from heaven, he did works that were so easy to him. But what God does with us through the power of the Holy Spirit, he takes humans, he takes natural things and, and worldly things, and he transforms them into supernatural. They do things beyond their capacity. Um, God gives, the, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God takes you to places you couldn't go on your own. He does things through you that you couldn't do on your own. And that's what God wants for us. And I believe God in this season is going to do greater works through us. If you receive that, say, I receive it in Jesus' name. We are meant for more. We should stop being lackadaisical. We should not be complacent in our faith. But we should have faith in God and actually seek to do greater works, to grow in God. Because God has called us to do it. There are people who need salvation and need or are dependent upon, upon God's disciples, apostles, and followers to do greater works. The author says, as he tried to process the brain-bending implications of greater works, he thought through some conversations he had recently with people who were feeling disappointed and stuck in their relationship with God and their place in life. The author says he meets more and more believers who are unsatisfied with the kind of Christians they're becoming and the version of Christian life they're experiencing. These aren't bad people. Uh, they aren't criminals. Uh, they're not pagans. They're, they're not people that blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They've just become what I call professional Christians. You develop a routine and your worship becomes mundane. Your prayer life becomes mundane because you know all the right uh, buzzwords to say, you know, all the right things to do, but it even becomes emotionally dull, let alone spiritually impotent. So we want to be the type of people who are on fire for God, who when God speaks through us and moves throughout a room, the atmosphere shifts. We want our worship to be changed, but even more importantly, we want our lives to be changed because we believe God has greater in store for us. God wants us to do greater and God is greater than anything we've ever seen. The thing is, most believers aren't in imminent danger of ruining their lives. They're facing a danger that's far greater, wasting their lives. When you don't access all that God has for you and the potential that God has in your life, you've missed the mark. We don't want people to miss the mark in life. We don't want people to be uh, mediocre in their faith, but we want you to be as great as God has called you to be. Now, I do want to throw a word of caution. Don't place a measuring rod of your faith and your greatness based on somebody else. Greatness is not being like somebody else or doing the same things somebody else did. They are experiencing their calling and their gifts. We just want you to maximize the gifts and talents and potential that God has placed in you so that you can fulfill your purpose for this world. 
There are some people who completely let go of time. And there are some people who, who, who miss the mark on so many things. We don't want that for you. Um, <clears throat> when the author talks about people who waste time and their gifts, these are some of the very people Jesus talked about in John chapter 14, verse 12. People who are supposed to be doing greater works and, and they forget about God. They forget about their life. They get so caught up in everything for the world that they forget about God. They get so caught up on their jobs. They get so caught up in their hobbies that they forget about God. But if you want greater from God, you got to spend more time with God and be intentional about the greater works. The author says we've had some big dreams about what God might want for our lives, but so many of us are stuck in the starting blocks or dragging along in the back of the pack. We know, and I love this sentence, we know we were meant for more. God has intended for us to experience greater, to do greater. And some of you are thinking about things in life that you have not accomplished. I even sense it right now. Some of you are thinking about things that you should have done and could have done. It's not too late. It's not too late to do greater works. And even if that particular assignment has passed on by, maybe God has even greater in store for you. But I want you to want greater for yourself. Don't be frustrated about where you are. Move forward in faith and believe that you are meant for more. The author then goes on to talk about miserable mediocrity. He says we all know instinctively, even if we can't articulate it exactly, that something isn't lining up. It isn't squaring up. There's a huge gap between what God said in his word and the results we are seeing in our lives. And some people try to uh, minimize the things that happened in the first century, or some modern theologians say, well, those things were meant for the early church, but not today. Now, there are some things that we should be experiencing, some manifestations of the spirit of the spirit that we are to be experiencing today. It's like we've been, but for so many of us, it's like we've been placed in such a comfortable, complacent position that we don't even desire the things of God. Then we wake up one day to find ourselves stuck in miserable mediocrity. So, so then we tuck away any dreams and notions of the great things and the great works we would like to do for God. There's a place for mediocrity in the world, but not in the kingdom of God. God is a God of excellence. God wants us to do excellent things and great things and greater works. After all, we're doing good, good enough. Sometimes it's frustrating. And if that's where you are today, I want to share a strong word of warning with you. You can't keep living with mediocrity. It's not fine for you to settle for going every day to a job you prefer to quit, doing decent work, being a pretty good person compared to your neighbor, paying your bills on time, and sporadically reading the Bible as though it's your guide to great things God did in other people's lives, but not your own. Baseline living is not okay, not for a believer in Jesus Christ. There's a price to pay for Christian complacency. If you keep living on this level, your heart is going to shrivel. Your spiritual growth is going to be stunted. And the purpose that you have may never be accomplished. What happens to a dream deferred? The question Langston Hughes asked many years ago. Someone, some of you watching tonight may have dreams that have felt deferred but it does not have to end. You can do greater. Your dreams, if you live with mediocrity, can die. But they don't have to die. You can make the choice today. Say, God, I want greater. If your dreams may feel like they're on life support, will you look up one day and be overwhelmed by the stack of regrets that you have in life, the frustration that has simmered on your life, and the things that you've placed on the back burner. We don't want you to be bitter about these things. We want you to have joy about all that the Lord has accomplished through you and for you. Opportunities to be used by God are ever present. The question is, will you seize the day and seize the moments for God? Just think about it. Think about that person who was saddened and desperately needed prayer. Did you pray for them? Think about that family that needed shelter. Did you help them? Think about somebody who needed healing. Did you believe that they could be healed? I tell you, child of God, part of our biggest obstacle is ourselves. The ceiling 
we need to remove in our faith. We, or we need to remove the ceiling on our faith and our belief system of what we think God can do. We need to believe God is capable of doing all things. And that just as scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have real lives to live and real problems to face and great accomplishments to, to make. And so we must go forward. We have no room in our cluttered minds for pie in the sky or negativity or toxicity, but belief in God and faith for greater. Most of the time we do well just to make a dent in the mountain of laundry or leave the house in time to beat the morning traffic. And it takes everything we have just to stay on top of the obstacles thrown at us like a high stakes arcade game, let alone climb the mountain of greatness or soar like some sort of eagle. We've seen posters of the, these types of things, and many people have dreamed about accomplishing great things, but now it's time to put up or shut up. Part of our problem of stepping out and being great for God is that it's painfully vague. What does it mean to be great for God anyway? What would be a truly great life in God's perspective? Would it be becoming a missionary, a great preacher, a teacher, whatever it is, or what is it? I tell you, child of God, I believe being great is being who God called you to be. And see, it's one thing to talk about doing great things for God, but how do you stick a pin in that part of the map and live there, live in greatness? Greatness is a slippery aspiration and a wild beast to ride if you ever get on top of it. Some people can accomplish a great act, but don't live in greatness. Our desire is to be greater, to experience greater on a regular daily basis. The fact is that kind of greatness, that unattainable schizophrenic kind that all that's always in the back of your mind, but always beyond your reach. Some say is a racket. Some say is unattainable, but we believe that God can have you experiencing more fullness of joy as you bask in his presence and live out his purpose for you. The author then goes on to say, that's why I have no interest in presenting you with a plan for pursuing greatness. Instead, I'm going to spend the rest of this book showing you the way to a place I call greater. This isn't just some gimmicky play on words. It's a game changing shift in how we approach God. Let me give you a simple way to look at the tension I've been describing. Good enough. The baseline living marked by mediocrity, being stuck in spiritual survival mode and being controlled by complacency. Greatness, the vague, unrealistic aspirations of doing better that don't work in real life. Good enough leaves you stuck in stagnation. Grasping for greatness leads to endless frustration, but greater is a third way. Greater is the life-altering understanding that God is ready to accomplish a kind of greatness in your life that is entirely out of human reach. It is something that you cannot accomplish on your own or that others cannot accomplish in their own. It goes beyond their max potential, but God does greater than what you could do as a human by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is beyond what you see in yourself or on your best day. It is even beyond what other people see in you, but God sees something in you and God can take you to a new level. God can take you to another place that is greater than what you're experiencing. So many people give up on God and give up on greatness. And it's not because they've given up on life, but they've gotten happy where they were. But the author and I want you to get to a place where you experience more than what you are experiencing and that you experience God in a more profound way. It's a way that doesn't have a lot of neon signs, but that leads directly to the place in which in God, we've always wanted to experience. The author says he found it while digging into the scriptural account of an Old Testament prophet. He found it buried in the examples of parents, students, employees, and bosses who are finding a greater passion for God than they've ever known. He finally found the door that leads to the life he's always known God is calling him to live. And in the pages that follow in the future lessons, we will enter a passageway together leaving our lives of good enough or just good enough behind once and for all, giving up on the false ideas of worldly greatness 
but experiencing greater, placing all our expectations, hopes, and fears squarely on the shoulders of a God whose power is greater than our minds can comprehend, a God whose power is greater than any power we have, and ascending to a greater realm of God's power than we ever imagined. It's a place where impossibilities cannot coexist with God's promises. Something has to give, and I believe God's promises will always prevail. It's not out there somewhere. It's in you right now. It's not reserved for wonder kinds like people like Steve Jobs or other celebrities or Father Abraham. It is the birthright of all believers, ordinary believers like you and me. It's not a state you'll achieve one day when the kids are out of the house or the retirement account hits a certain threshold or a particular sin isn't breathing down your neck anymore. It's a place in God you can tap into immediately. Greater is a place you can tap into God immediately, even while the dishes are piled high in the sink and you have unpaid balances on credit cards. Just as Jesus told Zacchaeus, he would be coming to his house that day. I want you to know that greater things can be coming your way immediately. They can start right now. The summons is sitting in your hands. Greater works are within your grasp. So what do you have to do to experience it? begins with faith. For now, let's just clarify our focus and prepare our hearts and simply ask the Lord in this moment to begin to open your eyes by faith, to enhance your hearing by faith, and to help you perceive that God has greater things in store for your future. As you read the upcoming section, let these simple promises stack up in your heart. These truths will be like kindling for the fire God wants to ignite in the pages to come. But it starts here with the question, are you ready to open your imagination to the possibility that God has a vision for your life that is greater than what you're experiencing, greater than the labels you were given when you were young by family and friends and whomever else, greater than the cynicism that may be settling in as you're getting older, greater than a life spent aimlessly wandering in cyberspace greater than empty earthly success that brings no eternal reward, greater than the shame tethered to you like a stone from the sins of your past, greater than the abuse you suffered at the hands of people you once trusted, greater than the hell you've been through and the trials of your life, greater than the specter of missed opportunities hovering over your bed and in your mind each and every night. Greater than the dreams you've dreamed for yourself, greater than even the greatest moment you've had thus far. You don't have to understand the implications of all of this, at least not yet, but you only have to be willing to have faith and believe and press into the greater things that God has already prepared for you to press towards the mark for the price of the high calling, not the low or the middle mediocre calling, but the high calling. I'd understand if you were tempted to not listen to this as a, another uh, self-hype or self-care or self-help promotion, dealing promises. And again, I, I'm saying you have possibility and potential. I'm not making any promises that something's going to happen to you today. But I know even that may seem far off for some of you. And, and it's justifiable to be suspicious of that. But it is true. God has greater for those audacious, bold, courageous people that exercise their faith and they believe that God is not calling you to greatness based on world standards, but greater than what you are currently experiencing in human standards. When you live this way, the greater way, God will empower you with the confidence to know that nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible with God. God will also give you the clarity to see the next step that God is calling you to take. He will empower you to live out the current assignment and to move on to the next. And God will give you the courage to do anything that God tells you to do. And it may be challenging sometimes, but God will give you the courage just as God has given you the faith. So you'll then get a real sense of what greater things God wants to do in your life. 
If you're in a place now where you're feeling stuck and you feel like you have no purpose, this Bible study is for you. If you feel like you've gotten in a routine and a rhythm and that's okay, but you feel like God has more in store for you, this is for you. And if you've ever questioned the greatness of God and how much God loves you and how much God cares for you and how much God can do, this Bible study is for you. And as you dig deeper into God's word and we study God's word together, you begin to get a real sense of what greater things God wants to do in your life. Maybe God will call you to make a major life change and you'll have to step out in faith to do so. Or maybe God simply wants you to come at your present life with greater passion from a fresh perspective. Maybe your greater is just to do great, greater works right where you are and just to exert more passion, more intellect so that you can truly fulfill your purpose. Either way, we'll see that the pathway to God's best is paved with faith. If you cannot exercise faith and believe God can do it, then how is it supposed to happen? If you choose to go forth to do greater, don't expect a final destination because what happens, God will continue to reveal more and show you more and you will understand that your work for the kingdom of God is never done until God calls you from labor to reward. And let's not look for other people to do greater things around us. Change starts with me. So let's start working with us or on us so that God can do greater works through us. The result will be a life of greater effectiveness, greater impact, greater vision. That's why the book is called Greater. And its emphasis is to embrace the joy of the journey because the destination is a mirage. And that's the thing about God's leading in our lives. It's not static. It's not automatic, but it's imminent. And it has the potential to change everything, not only your perspective, but your peace and your prosperity. God's greater vision for your life isn't based on a formula. It's built on a promise. God created you for more. We'll look closely at what the Bible says more or greater looks like. You'll be inspired to dream bigger than you ever have. But also know that dreams do not control you or dreams are not the goal, but the work for God is the goal. And you'll be challenged to start small and through simple steps of radical, courageous faith or what some would call crazy faith and radical obedience, you'll experience more. So if you are worn out on the cul-de-sac of Christianity or you are sick and tired of self-help pseudo, uh, pseudo solutions, the good news is that Today is the day God's greater plan for your life begins in full force. The bad news is that every Batman has a joker. And the greater life God has promised you isn't going to show up and save the day without a struggle or without a fight. <clears throat> Some of us have experienced God doing great things, but we also can testify that it has come with great cost. And so if you're ready, we'll pray and we'll go into chapter two. God, we thank you for what you've already shown us. And as we now move into chapter two, God, we pray that you show us even more. Reveal yourself to us. We love you, oh God. We give you glory, thanks, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So the author um, talks about a lesser loser life. And the lesser loser life is the opposite of everything greater that God has for us or calls us to be. Um, we like to pretend it doesn't exist, yet it's the part of us that often seems to dominate our decisions and talks us out of doing great things for God. If you ever had something that causes you to doubt yourself or doubt God, that's the lesser loser life. If you ever have anything that causes you to question the people in whom you love, that's the lesser loser life. <clears throat> And so you want to hear God's voice in these moments and not just focus on the negativity. Now, the author has a transparent moment where he talks about how he has experienced great things, but he's also had challenges. And I believe it is important to be transparent and face uh, your challenges and acknowledge how God brought you through, but also the struggles you had. The author says, you would think someone who has seen God do so many great things would have minimal temptation to settle for anything less. You would think he'd be a permanent graduate of God's greater university. Then why, as times as he's walked out on stage, 
to preach to thousands of people? Does he have to literally sometimes talk to himself aloud to drown out the voice inside him speaking discouragement, the lesser loser life, the, the one that tries to alter your, your plan and God's plan and tries to take you down a path of mediocrity and negativity? Don't listen to that voice. Listen to the voice of God. For the author, the voice was saying to him, you don't belong here. You don't deserve to be here. You know what? Sometimes when people or we feel that we don't add up or we don't value, maybe it's true. But with God on our side, with God's grace and mercy, I don't have to add up. But God adds up all the time. God makes the difference. The Holy Spirit makes the difference. And so even in the midst of your questioning, yield not to that temptation, but yield to God. The author, again, continues to share about his struggles. He sometimes has nightmares. In the middle of the day, um, he has visions that disturb him. He could be writing a sermon and still that little bit of doubt can seep in his mind. And you would wonder how this happens to people. Sometimes the enemy sees the greatness in you and goes in attack mode. In fact, I would argue, if you never felt this kind of pressure or uh, questioning or doubt, or lack of confidence, maybe the enemy doesn't see you as a threat. But when the enemy sees greatness in you, it will do all it can to take you off your course. So stay the course. Don't look left or look right, but stay with God. If the devil can't suck us into the lesser loser life through complacency, then they'll try to trap us with condemnation. If they don't tell us it's not worth it to work this hard or do this, then they'll try to condemn us for the things we've done. We believe God can do great things, but we crop ourselves out of the picture. We say, but not me. I, I can't do it. Or God can't use me because I've done too much. If God continues to love you, you have to love yourself. The author says he knows what it feels like to read a book about the great things God wants to do and to feel like it applies only to people who are better than him. People who pray more, who know more, who have their lives more together than he does. But here's the paradox. In those same moments when he's gotten, when he has questioned his calling or gotten some doubts and wondered whether he has what it takes to make a difference, he's also simultaneously been a part of something greater than he ever knew to even dream about. That's the beauty of the greater way. It's all about what Jesus has already done and what he desires to do through us. Nobody does greater things for God because they've got it all together. And nobody is disqualified because they don't. God doesn't do greater things exclusively through great people. He does them through anyone who is willing to trust him in greater ways. God, I'm going to say that again, doesn't do greater things exclusively through great people. He does great things through anyone who is willing to trust him in greater ways. That might be hard for you to believe right now, but believe it. Say, I believe it right now. Type in the comments. I believe it right now that God is, is capable of doing anything through whomever God wants to. And I believe God can and will do great things through me. <clears throat> Hopefully, we can be more like Elijah and Elisha. And we're going to focus now on the story of Elisha and how God did greater through him. We'll look through the lens of a few experiences in Elisha's life and, and see him as an example of God doing greater. However, before we can follow Elisha to the heights of a greater life, we'll need to track him down in some obscure farm fields long before he became a hero of the faith. He was stuck in the repetitive movement of mundane, average, mediocre living, not performing miracles, but waiting for destiny to make a cameo appearance in a predictable scene. Elisha started out just like many of us, living under the tyranny of the ordinary, plowing hard dirt. He never launched an iPad or rolled out a Think Different and ad campaign, but he did reach for something greater. God granted it to him in a way that changed his generation in a way that has the potential to change us today. When we first meet Elisha, he is plowing a field. He's just a guy plowing in the field. 
First Kings chapter 19, verse 19 says he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Plowing is back-breaking work. Not only can Elisha taste his own sweat, he can taste the very smell of the oxen. He has dust caked in his hair and coating in his nostrils and lungs. And when you spend every day plowing, the smells and scenery are always the same. Monday, you have a ringside seat for oxen rears. Tuesday, if you look out the window to your right, more oxen rears. Wednesday's in-flight entertainment, oxen rears. Thursday, you click on oxenrears.com. Friday's special, more crust and filth for you from Master Chef Oxen Rear. The next Monday, you get up and start the cycle all over again. This might sound bad. But plowing with oxen pays the bills. How many of you have been there? While it may not be oxen or oxen rears, you go through the same routine each and every day, and you wonder, when does God have something different for me? One day, on the day Elisha receives the calling that ignites God's greater vision for his life, he's shuffling to the slow pace of the ordinary, as he always has. He wakes up, gets dressed, gets to plow, drives the oxen, coughs up dust, eats lunch, drives the oxen, coughs up dust, gets clean, eats dinner, goes to bed, wakes up the next morning, and starts all over again. There's nothing wrong with the good hard work. Some scholars think the 12 teams of oxen belong to a wealthy landowner, and Elisha was the man in charge of them all. So what his job lacked in appeal or notoriety or glamour he made up for instability. It was consistent work, consistent scenery, consistent smells, and consistent pay. There were days when Elisha was swept up in the intoxicating tyranny of the familiar. Does this sound familiar to any of you? Where he, every day seems to be the same scenario, same song. But every morning as he steps into the slow crawl behind the plow, he's not just chasing the oxen's tails, he is chasing his own. Can you relate to that kind of work? that kind of life, <clears throat> um, some of you can relate. Wake up, get dressed, grab your work tools, do what you have to do, eat lunch, resume the work, get clean, eat dinner, watch TV, go to bed, wake up the next morning, get dressed, grab your tools, do the same thing over and over again. Doing the same stuff over and over again is a good thing in many instances. Routine is a vital and biblical component of our relationship with God. It's also the key to maintaining a marriage, holding down a job, staying in shape, and achieving many other desirable goals. But that's not the kind of repetition we need to be rescued from. It's the kind of discipline we should embrace. What we need to be saved from is the kind of baseline living that the author talked about earlier. We've already considered some of the dangers of just good enough. And he gave some examples of some general descriptions of what that looks like. Now let's unpack some ways to recognize it. And if we can identify the trappings of good enough, we'll be better equipped to guard ourselves against it. One is monotony. Spiritual monotony works against you in several subtle ways. When it sets in the things that used to bring energy and passion to your walk with God become duty and drudgery. When you start mindlessly plowing activities like Bible study and church attendance begin to fall more into the I have to than the I get to or I want to category. And if it's an obligation, it feels like more of an obligation than an opportunity. That's a bad place. And that is where complacency incubates. Then it spreads to other areas of your life. The way it grows is deceptive. You get stuck and comfortable in the certain lifeless routine. And you stay there long enough to get dependent on the routine. And then finally, you're afraid to leave the routine, even though you've grown to hate it. Or worse yet, even though God is calling you out of it. I know a lot of really good people who would admit that for the most part, their lives revolve around the kind of mindless plowing that we saw in 1 Kings 1919 with Elisha. Everyone is susceptible to it. It's a trap that many people fall into. The author gives us some ways that we can get out of this. And again, everybody's susceptible to it, preachers, teachers, leader. Then once you notice you're in this trap of the mundane and the mediocre, how do you get out? How do you break through? One, believe that there's more for you. And then two, let's see what happens with Elisha. 
The author talks about it in this part of chapter three, which says, God is talking behind your back. It was an ordinary day for Elisha, just like the day is for you. And when the predictable beat of his ordinary life was interrupted and everything changed, the interruption didn't happen the way most of us think it should. God's interruptions rarely do. Elisha didn't go to a career fair or meet with a life coach to talk about some new possibilities. Elisha wasn't looking for a different kind of life. And get this, Elisha wasn't praying. He was doing the best he could with the life he assumed he had been handed. And that is the key for many of us. Do your best where you are, where you're planted, and God will give the increase. God had been watching Elisha hundreds of miles away from the tyranny of the plow. God had been talking about Elisha behind his back. And the gist of the conversation was that God had something greater for him, a divine calling beyond his imagination. And here comes Elijah. You probably know Elijah 100 times better than you know Elisha. He's the guy who faced down the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18 and in other chapters in 1 Kings. In something like a religious steel cage match, the battle of Baal with the 400 prophets. And he called down fire from heavens. Elijah is the Mick Jagger of the Old Testament prophets. That's at least what the author says. And recently, God had told Elijah to appoint Elisha as his successor. In obedience to God's instruction, Elijah makes his way to the field searching for his successor. Elisha doesn't know it yet, but the great prophet Elijah in his neighborhood with plans to anoint him as the nation's next prophet. After that encounter, nothing will be the same. The presence of Elijah in what seems to be an ordinary situation will thrust Elisha's life in an extraordinary new direction. This brings us to the crucial first step for breaking away from the inertia of good enough. Igniting God's vision starts with becoming more acutely aware of God's presence in your life. Not just generally believing that God is present in the universe, but understanding how he's present in your ordinary situation. Desiring to do extraordinary work in your life in a way that's even more real yet less than obvious. Then Elijah's presence in the field with Elisha, God is present with you, watching over you, planning greater things for you. For a lot of people, God's presence is abstract and theoretical. Sure, God is everywhere, but it's a different thing to believe that he is personally watching over the intricacies of your life. Maybe you're thinking there's nothing of note about your life. Certainly nothing worth God's attention. The paparazzi aren't exactly waiting in the bushes to see you in your workout clothes and sell the footage to TMZ. So why should you believe that you have undivided attention of the God who created the world, who created the galaxies, the sun, the moon, and the stars? I want you to reflect on a few verses from one of the Psalms. David penned these words of assurance at a time when God seemed distant to him. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the deeps, in the depths, you are there. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. No matter how isolated you feel far out in the field, God is there. He's been with you all along. And he's seen you punch the clock and stir the coffee and surf the internet and return the calls. God is there. Don't be surprised and amazed that God's eyes are on you because he doesn't see you through the eyes of dis disapproval or disappointment. God's presence is not a sign of condemnation. It's actually an invitation. God is present with you through his Holy Spirit because he intends to uproot you from the tyranny of familiarity and shatter the monotonous life that you've had and take you on an adventure. God is going places and taking you places you've never been and doing things you've never done. And it all comes down to a question. Will you follow me into greater things? Just as Elijah personally issued that invitation to Elisha, one greater than Elijah is issuing the invitation to you. Becoming aware of his presence is the first step in realizing his purpose. But let's go deeper and look at how Elijah approached Elisha. His story shows us some powerful connections about the way God calls each of us to greater things, especially when we least expect it. The Bible says Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. 
Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Did you see that? Apparently, Elisha doesn't hesitate. He lets go of the plow and runs after the elder prophet. Not that he has much time to decide. Notice that Elijah is not stopping by for coffee. He doesn't sit down with Elisha to have a leisurely chat about the weather and the kids and new plowing techniques. He doesn't ask Elisha if he's really happy doing what he's doing. He doesn't ask him about his deepest, darkest secrets or what he dreamed of doing when he grew up. That's because he doesn't have to. God has already told him that Elisha's days of mindless plowing are about to end. And even though Elisha doesn't have a clue, God is often working behind the scenes of your life, orchestrating his destiny for you. And even though you don't have a clue what he's up to, just because you haven't heard God call your name or tell you specifically what to do with your life, doesn't mean he's not conspiring great things for you. God sometimes like to, likes to sneak up on you. If you're marching along to the beat of ordinary, then one day the ordinary will be interrupted by a calling. That calling can change everything if you discern it. Elisha's calling came through a lightning quick encounter with Elijah. Some came in part in church and worship. Do you remember when God called you or when God told you that he loves you and you first recognized it and you were saved and you got baptized? Do you remember those moments? God continues to speak to us and affirms our calling. Some people sense their calling, which may have been to start a business or pursue their vocation with greater passion through one sentence in a casual conversation, either with a friend, family member, member Sunday school teacher, whomever. Some have experienced affirmation through their parents. There are so many examples because God communicates vision differently to everyone he calls. So it won't be the ex exactly the same for you as it was for me, for the author, or for Elisha. So how will you know when God is interrupting your life with this calling? You have to pay attention to the spiritual vibrations around you. Evaluate the interruptions he's using to knock you off rhythm. Examine the way God is aligning the truths in his word with the context of your life. Is there a message that seems to be hitting you upside the head over and over again? That's one way you can know God is trying to tell you something. Other times you may not hear it as clearly, but if you'll position yourself in God-focused places like church and around godly-centered people, you'll learn to hear God in greater ways over time. The ways God speaks his calling into our lives are as unique as the colors he spun when he spoke the world into existence. The thing is, you don't have to get all wrapped up in figuring out how God's calling will come to you. Just be ready to respond in faith when it does. And when Elijah throws his cloak, his mantle of ministry unto Elisha. He doesn't even talk to him, and yet more is communicated in that cloak falling on Elisha's shoulders than anything Elijah could have said over a hundred cups of coffee. The cloak, a simple item fashioned out of wool or skin, communicates this message. You weren't meant for what you're doing, Elisha. You were meant to spend the rest of your life, or uh, you were not meant to spend the rest of your life aiming at oxen or looking at oxen. God has something else for you. He wants to break you out of this tyranny of the familiar or this familiar place, and take you to a world of unpredictability, yet awesome wonder. Your life can be greater. The cloak spills over Elisha like a tub of ice cold water, waking him up from the monotony, the mundane, and the routine he had, waking him up from the familiar. And when the prophet's cloak lands on the plowman's shoulders, he's no longer a plowman. So now the real choice comes. Is Elisha going to choose the greater life that God has called him to or spend his life looking at oxen? This is a man that's used to the rhythm of plowing the oxen, but God has more. And so what he does is he burns the plows. He chooses God and he separates himself from the familiar. I've seen this too often. In fact, one of the things I've seen with uh, musicians who have a calling on their life to preach, at some point, they may have to make a choice. Are you going to continue to play music? Now, don't get me wrong. God can call people to both. But I have seen some struggle with that tension that they want to walk away. But because it's so familiar and it's, it's helpful financially, they continue to do what they're familiar with. 
Sometimes God will tell you to completely distance yourself with what is comfortable or familiar so that you can go to greater. If God has called all of us to do great things, then why do most people not experience them? If everyone is called to that which is greater, why do so many people stay stuck? Elisha's story suggests it's because too often we pick the wrong place to begin pursuing the greater things God has for us. And we aren't willing to burn the plows. We're not willing to break away from what is familiar. Elisha took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Elisha destroys the things that he was familiar with so that he could walk away. And although this may seem extreme, after all, he could have given away the oxen. Elisha lived in a society where uh, things were understood and he had to separate himself because of what God was doing. Elisha doesn't just cook the cattle. He burns the plows. He knows that if the plows are still there, there could be the temptation to go back to the familiar. You have to be willing to loosen the shackles and go forth and do great things. We're going to stop there. Uh, we'll come back to greater. We'll look at this in another devotional entitled Greater Than. This book that we looked at today is called Greater by Stephen Furtick. I hope it blessed you and challenged you to do greater works. Love you with the love of Christ. We'll be back next week. God bless.